welcome everybody to our second three-person officiating session. Um, Georgia, Stace, I guess you guys are going to be letting people in as they come in. Um, Stacey, if you want to maybe take that, and uh, Georgia, uh, let you go with the uh, introductions. Good evening, everybody, and welcome. Uh, thank you so much for joining us uh, again tonight. Um, a couple of housekeeping things just from a bandwidth perspective. Um, last time we had um, over 215 people on the call. Um, if it's a possibility, if you can shut off your cameras, that will help with tape. Um, um, as well as if you can mute your mics, uh, just in terms of background noise, um, that would be uh, fantastic. Um, thank you again for joining us. Um, just wanted to introduce um, everybody of our presenters tonight. Um, Kayla Herdman is our OUA official and a FIBA three on three official. Welcome Kayla. Um, Kayla. Alyssa Spoonie is our OUA official that is joining us for the evening. Rob Caparici uh, is our FIBA uh, nominated game official licensee and also our OUA official. And then joining us from CBOC tonight is John McFarlane, our national educator, as well as our national tournament selection and, ev and evaluation committee uh, chair. So I'd like to uh, welcome uh, John. If uh, you don't mind uh, saying a couple of words before we get started, that would be fantastic. Thanks, Georgia. Uh, welcome, everyone. Thank you for the invitation tonight to join with you. Great project. Uh, love, love that you guys are doing some basketball during this uh, long off season that we've had. My, my job at uh, as a member of CBOC, as Georgia said, is is uh, a, a little bit of, of of a number of things. National championships fall under my bailiwick, assignment of officials, evaluation of officials at national championships. Referee coaches, uh, assigning them to the championships as well. Um, uh, a little bit of development and education. Um, that falls under the education portfolio of CBOC. And uh, I'm going to throw out a, a thank you to Dean Crowley for being the chair of our development education committee as we rewrite the NOCP program. We've, we're, we've finished NOCP 1 and we're testing NOCP 2 and then NOCP3 will be ready for the fall. So last two years, we spent a lot of time on that and uh, the product's gonna be wonderful when they're done. So that's kind of my job in, in, in a nutshell. And uh, like I said, thanks for the invitation tonight. I really look forward to uh, participating. Okay, thanks very much, John. Um, really appreciate uh, you being here. Um, John's gonna help us break down a, a few clips uh, as we go along. But Stacy's going to lead us with our objectives and a little bit of a review um, from our last session. So, Stacy, do you want to take it away? Sure thing. Thanks, Dave. Uh, welcome, everybody. <clears throat> Thank you for joining us um, again tonight. Uh, this is a, a repeat slide for us. Our objectives haven't uh, changed. Uh, create consistency throughout Ontario. Um, and we know that we've opened this up um, across the country. So. Um, Thank you if you're joining us from outside of Ontario, and hopefully we can um, build some consistency across um, across Canada as well. Um, we're looking to um, implement uh, FIBA language to uh, uh, help with that consistency and help us with our communication as well. And like we mentioned last week, all of this information is being taken directly from the FIBA manual, and all of that was sent out and made available to you. Um, before our presentations began, and they can all be found on um, game plan as well, if that's something that you uh, you need to use. So okay. moving on. So a little bit of a review from last so, yeah. So just to review our core coverage principles, um, and when we talk about FIBA language, part of our conversation earlier is um, earlier tonight before we got started, um, Mike pointed out to me that I had uh, used um, some language that wasn't feeble language. So we're going to go back to that line right down the middle, which is our, our split line. Um, our center official is going to take everything from the split line and over to their, um, their sideline. They're going to be responsible for all of that area. Our trail official is working from the split line to their sideline. And they are also going to be responsible uh, down to the second hatch mark on the um, on the key, as well as taking care of three point coverage into the far corner. And then if we have a look at our lead official, again, we're working with that split line right down the middle and lead is taking care of that high traffic area that is um, 
the boundary being that second hatch mark on the uh, key again, and then the three point line. And both of our uh, diagrams that we have available um, on the screen right now are just the, um, just the flip of one another. So you've got to look at, at, at both versions. Okay, thanks very much, Stacy. Um, so we're gonna get right into it. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit about uh, lead uh, positions and working area. Um, so Kayla, if you could please uh, take it away. Okay, so we're gonna start talking with our lead position. Um, and while all positions on the floor are important, of course, the lead position is exceptionally important because lead is going to initiate the rotations. And so it's important that lead is in the right position because if lead isn't, then it makes it more challenging for the rest of our crew to also be in the right position. So we're gonna focus on movement along our baseline um, with our body ideally angled at about a 45 degree angle towards the basket. Um, and that will be our outside in um, kind of demeanor, but that doesn't mean that you don't have to move um, away from that 45 degree angle. But when we're talking about how we're going to set up, we're ideally going to start at about that 45 degree angle. We're gonna move um, no more than one meter from the baseline, normally outside of the paint and off of the court a little bit. Um, and we're going to keep working along that baseline to achieve that open angle that John's gonna talk about a little bit more. Um, but we want to make sure that we're in the right position to be able to see um, not the back of players, but be able to see through the play uh, in order to increase our call accuracy as well. Um, we're going to make sure we're focused on our primary coverage area, um, but we're also going to recognize where the action area is. And that's also going to assist with increasing um, your accuracy and anticipating the play is recognizing where the active area is and having that active mindset as an official. Um, we obviously have a normal setup position and that's kind of where we're going to start as lead. Uh, and then we can progress to a closed down position before we begin to rotate. Um, and so that, that setup position is going to be really important again at that 45 degree angle. Um, and it's gonna be located between our lane lines on the free throw line um, and the three point line extended. And then we're going to move along the baseline in order to mirror the ball. Um, and again, getting ready to anticipate what plays are going to be forthcoming. Okay. Next one. Uh, all right. Next slide here. Um, always good to have uh, some visual. Um, so here you go, Kayla. Okay. So um, again, if you want to just pull up that next point there. So our working area is going to be um, highlighted in that blue area there. And again, you can see the lead is rotated kind of towards that 45 degree angle. So that would be our outside in. Um, if the ball progresses beyond where that lead is located on that baseline there, then we may need to go to an inside out approach. So that would be turning our body away from that 45 degree angle and expanding the angle um, so that we can get, uh, again, our, our PCA making sure that action area is being covered. We're aiming to have distance from that baseline, again, no more than a meter, uh, and also be stationary when we're making our calls to, to improve that accuracy as well. Um, and so, again, anticipating the play, you want to try and think one step ahead. Um, and something that can assist with that is identifying your post-play matchups, uh, the active matchups in particular. And so it kind of leads way to where you need to be to, to referee your PCA. And that doesn't necessarily mean a low block. We could have something higher up towards that second um, lane spot, as uh, Stacy just pointed out. Um, so while we're giving you a reference point in terms of a setup position in 45 degrees, we do need to move along that baseline to mirror the ball and to keep and achieving that uh, open angle. You can see that X on the baseline there. Obviously, we don't want to be refereeing from underneath the basket. Um, and we don't want to be refereeing from inside the paint too much either. Obviously, there's exceptions to kind of every standard rule. Um, but you're not going to have the best position if you're refereeing from under the basket. So if you're in a position closer to that X, then that means you probably should be considering rotating. Um, and we will talk about rotations as, as we move through the next couple of weeks here. Uh, the other thing is when you're moving, you should be moving with purpose. So you, you need to be able to ask yourself, why are you moving? Um, and you should be able to answer that question to yourself. If not, then you're 
you're moving without purpose. Um, and oftentimes when we move without purpose, we actually streamline ourselves so that we disadvantage and we don't have that open angle anymore. Um, and then we're having to retract and move back. Um, so kind of just wasted energy. So make sure that you are moving with purpose and that you know why you're moving in the first place. Um, so when we look at where lead is going to be, lead is obviously going to be on strong side with trail. Um, and we want to make sure that the ball has settled on that side. Um, and again, just anticipating that the active matchups and allowing your, your movement to be um, dictated by the players on the floor rather than necessarily a set image that we're looking at here. Um, the other thing that we'll talk about lastly for lead position is uh, on this image, we have our setup position, but if um, lead moves in towards that paint area, um, we move into more of a closed down position. Again, we don't want to be staying in closed down um, because that's not the optimal position. You can't achieve that 45 degree angle and open your peripheral vision to all of your PCA. So when we move from um, set it up to close down, we're not going to stay there. We're either going to rotate or pop back out to a setup position, depending again on what the ball is doing to mirror the ball. Okay, and we're gonna make sure that we can see the front of the rim. So when we can see the front of the rim that prevents us from refereeing in that no officiating zone. Uh, so if you just take a quick peek and look, it kind of gives you a point of reference to ask yourself if you're too far in the, towards the key, um, you should be able to see the front of the rim for, for most of the play. All right. Thank you very much, Kayla. So Kayla, I'm just going to ask you a question. Um, so when we talk about our initial setups, um, like, uh, with your stature, um, do you find, um, you know, working the lead position uh, a little challenging um, as uh, a lot of the players that you do officiate um, are taller than you? <laughs> I guess we could look at my short stature as challenging. Um, yeah, I definitely, again, this is just a guideline. We want to be where we need to be to officiate the active matchups. And that may be a little bit different for everyone. So if you're comparing my height, which may not be as tall as some of the, the, the males or females that you're officiating, I probably need to be a little bit further off of the baseline than perhaps someone who's an official that's taller, um, or even just maybe a step farther out towards our sidelines. Um, especially when we have high, high um, rim play going on. Um, my obviously not being as high, my peripheral is not going to be as tall as, as someone else who's a taller official. So you, we're giving you a guideline, but it's, it's about where you need to be to be able to achieve that open angle, mirror the ball, see through the players um, to increase that accuracy of your calls. Oh, great. Uh, awesome stuff. Thanks very much. Appreciate that. Um, okay. So our next uh we're going to talk a little bit about the lead position a little bit more. And uh, John is going to take us through uh, the cross call. So the, the first thing, the first point on our, our slide to, tonight is when the lead makes calls on the weak side, especially on a drive, the decisions are usually incorrect because they're not seeing the play from start to finish. So this takes us back to, our pregame and, and what we discuss in the locker room. So we have to be all on the same page. We have to talk about the split line of the court and that we're going to leave that for the center official. We, we, and we really have to spend some time on that in our pregame and we have to trust in our partner. So if I'm lead and, and I'm, I'm on uh, weak side, I'm leaving that for my center official. So I want to make sure that in the pregame, we're all on the same page. And that takes trust. And that takes trust. We have to look at um, trusting in our partners. And trust is built up uh, with a great pregame. So taking your board out, writing on it, looking at, looking at uh, putting the ball in, in different positions and saying, okay, who's going to blow the, whose primary is this? And then having all the crew agree and going out onto the court and doing that. So really, really can't stress enough that pregame uh, pre preparation. Weak side drive lead may call low and front swipes. Absolutely. Um, we can peek out to see where the center is. 
um, and get experience and see what, what they're looking at as well. Kayla talked about open angle. Key to success all the time is an open angle. We, we gotta be able to see. Um, the more people we can put in our open angle, the better chance we have to make a correct call. When I was first started refereeing three person and I hated it because I liked two person and I liked making every second call. Um, I was taught that we, in, in a three person game, if I was lead to imagine a, a black curtain down the middle of the court, it was a dark out curtain. You couldn't see through it. Anything on the other side of the curtain was not my call. And that helped me in my mind to understand when to blow my whistle and when not to blow my whistle. Okay. Thanks very much, John. We have a diagram of the cross call that is in our, uh, that is in our three person um, FIBA uh, manual that we have. And it's pretty straightforward, right? Um, so um, as the drive comes from uh, the weak side, as John pointed out, um, what we don't want to do is have the lead call across. So John, our next one is, uh, this is the diagram. I've got a, I've got a clip. Um, uh, for you to maybe that, that you can comment on and we can have a look at it. I got to play it a few times and, uh, and, then we can, uh, and then we can go from there and you can comment and uh, we'll go from there. So um, as John pointed out, lead must have trust in the center and trusting the lead and having an active center. Okay, so here is maybe our first video clip. Uh, just hang on. Stacey, you got this uh, video clip all ready to go? I thought I had it going. Just give me one second. No. Nope. Just while Dave's looking for that clip, it's really, really important that the center hustles down the court and gets it into an excellent setup position. Foul line extended on the court, um, ready to referee. Um, if, if they're stationary and they have a chance to see the play without their head moving again, a much better chance to make the call correct. So that center, even though sometimes it seems you don't have to run as far in the center position, getting there as quickly as possible and getting ready to referee, active mindset, so important. Okay, thanks, Stace. I thought I had this all set. Stacey, can you make that bigger on the screen? Stacey, you're muted. Sorry. <laughs> no, um, it doesn't look like I can. I'll see what I can do um, That's good. For, for next week. Let me just run it back here. We're all good. All right. So just play that again, Stace. Yep, no problem. Okay, folks, in your chat box, who's primary on that call? Who's primary call? Absolutely, good job. Um, centers 100% call, right? Um, lead bid on that because there was a lot of there was a lot of contact, and instead of letting the play uh, develop, let center take that play. We, we we got in trouble because I I believe on this one, one was a block, one was a charge. I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's correct. Yeah. Right. So in our pregame, we have to talk about this play. And center's in a perfect position. Look where they are. Um, I'd like to see them on the floor, maybe one more step, just a step onto the floor. Um, no, no bodies in between, ready to referee. Everything's good. So if we can run it one more time, Dave, please. Yeah, go ahead. You can see the split line down the middle. It's well on the other side of the court. Center's call. Again, that's a pregame uh, discussion. 
um, get your whiteboard out, move, move the magnets around, talk about it, um, look at tape. And as lead, we have to have a patient whistle. We have to see that play from start to finish. And as soon as that ball goes across that half court line as lead, I'm like, okay, I'm looking for my next competitive matchup. I don't have to worry about, uh, I trust in my center and I'm ready to go. Okay, thanks very much, John. Appreciate that. Um, Stace, you might as well take the deck um, if these videos aren't gonna work. So you might as well take the deck from here and I'll just talk you through it. Um, so uh, thanks very much, John. Appreciate your insight on that. Um, and, you know, we looked at diagrams, we looked at clips of the cross call and that's something that we want to avoid. Um, so Rob, you're gonna talk a little bit about the lead position um, and the lead uh, crossover step, if you, uh, if you could do that for us, we'd appreciate it. Awesome, sounds great. Um, so we're gonna talk a little bit about the cross step, uh, which can be used in a number of different situations, but specifically here talking about the lead. So in the cross step, what we're looking for here specifically is when the ball enters uh, that strong side low post that you can see here in the diagram. Um, so Lee's got a nice uh, vision right between the players on a bit of a 45 there. But what we want to be able to, to do here as lead is understand that this play, when A1 has the ball in their hands, they're likely looking to go towards the rim. Um, so to prepare for that play, what we want to do is as A1 starts to make that move towards the rim, what we don't want to go with the play. We want to go in the exact opposite direction in order to maintain that distance from the play um, and to maintain that 45 degree angle. So as Kayla talked about that big X right in the middle where we don't want to referee from, um, as A1 moves towards the rim, so moving in the left direction here, we're going to want to see lead move across the baseline, away from the basket in the opposite direction, which is why we're using that cross step to maintain that open angle and that 45 degrees. Uh, if we can click through that space, there we go, perfect. So that's exactly what we want to look to see. Um, Stace, you want to click one more there for me? Bingo. So by moving away from the play like this uh, and using that cross step to go in the opposite direction in which the play went, the lead official is able to maintain that distance from the play that we want um, in order to see that, that whole play. The biggest thing here that we want is we want to be able to see the space between the players, but we're not refereeing that space. Um, so when we're refereeing a competitive matchup like this, we're looking to referee the defense, the legality of the defense with keeping the offense in our field of vision as well. Um, one big thing here, uh, at least in my experience with this, and I know that it's talked about a lot in the IOTs, uh, with FIBA is that as we get closer to plays, it often feels faster and we can lose perspective of all the movements that are happening. Um, and they use a really great example that if we were to watch a game from the upper rafters, the game seems very slow. Whereas if we were to watch that same game courtside, the game feels very fast when in reality, it's the exact same game. The concept here is just that the further we maintain from the play and keeping that distance, we're able to keep that open angle we're able to see the entire play and then referee the legality of that defender and the offensive player. All right. So uh, we're going to have a, a clip. Uh, I think the next uh, one is uh, a clip. And uh, Stace, if you could just, <clears throat> we'll run it through a few times. And then if you could just hold it at the start after we run it through a couple of times. Okay. Thank you. Hold on, I might be struggling with this one too. Yeah, just give me one sec. Hold on, I've pulled up the... Um, why we wait, why we wait. Um, Rob, you have a question in the in the chat. Um, uh, Rob's uh, asked, uh, what if a, uh, A1 drives the other way? So if A1 drives the other way, then we're still gonna use utilize that cross step and make sure that we're able to see that, that space in between the players and referee the legality of the defense. Um, if we had utilized the cross step, if A1 moves out to the right in that case, our cross step would take us towards the left or perhaps staying exactly where we are. Um, I think it was Kayla, it may have been John that had said that we want to move with a purpose. We're not moving just for the sake of moving. So sometimes the position that we are already in is the correct position and we may not need to move. We might have to open our body to the play to keep that field of vision. We don't want to be looking over our shoulder at the play. We want to make sure that we open our shoulders 
signify to everyone, including our partners, that we are on that flight. Okay. Thanks, Rob. Okay, so uh, Stace, I think I got it. Uh, I got it pulled up here. I pulled it up from my drive. Um, so, <laughs> I'm almost uh, there too. <laughs> okay, can everybody see that? All good there, yeah, we got that. Okay, so I'm just gonna play it through a few times. Okay, we're just gonna replay that. So in this particular clip, we don't see a lot of the lead. However, um, uh, as the lead cross steps out, but um, Rob, maybe you can comment on, uh, you know, positioning and cross yeah. stepping and things like that. Yeah, let's start here, Dave. Um, sure. So we can, we can see the initial, the initial kind of setup here of this official uh, on our lead position. Um, they almost look like maybe they were in a closed down position and have decided that that might not be the correct positioning and are trying to move back out to that setup position closer to the three point line. Um, and we can see that they're not on a 45 degree angle for that initial setup here. And they're looking over their right shoulder. So when we think of field of vision, if we were to imagine their eyes and what they can see, they can likely only see probably the ball, the ball handler, uh, the defender of the ball handler, and maybe that help defense is coming in. So they might only have three players in their field of vision. Um, so that wouldn't be the ideal setup that we want. There we go. Thanks, Dave. Yeah. Now, as this play starts to develop, lead, well, unfortunately, they're gonna leave, the, they're gonna leave uh, the frame here, but lead starts to take that cross step. They start moving away. There we go. So they've, now they've cross step, they've, we hold it there. And right away, now they have opened up. They're gonna be able to referee the legality of that defense. They're gonna see that space, not re again, not refereeing the space. And they've created them, they've created that distance from the play. Um, so being outside of where that W is on the floor there for Western, um, they now have all the players in their field of vision. They've maintained that open angle and they're going to be able to referee the legality of this play uh, from a defensive and offensive perspective um, and be able to make the correct judgment on it because they're in the correct position on it. Okay. So if we... bingo. So there we go. So now we can see. Um, because lead has already done that movement and they've set themselves up with that cross step, they've got that perfect look in on this play um, and able to referee the legality of the defender. Right. So, you know, always something to work on. And, uh, and if we look at that initial setup, you know, um, you know, we, you talked exactly about, you know, and Mike talked about it last week about, you know, looking over our shoulder, rather than squaring up and getting to 45s. And we can see that our field of vision on this is really limited, but if we open up a little bit, um, we can take all those players into account to help out. Okay, so uh, Stace, if you wanna go to the next slide, I'll, uh, I'll pull up that, that clip uh, from that. Sorry about, we had, you know, it's like your car, everything works perfect. And then all of a sudden something goes wrong. So sorry about this, we'll just get our, are things set up okay so okay stace i think we are at i'm yeah. coming i think All it right. will play now too so hopefully the the rest of them will be okay just a just a glitch. okay okay yeah we got it all straightened out so thank you very much so Alyssa, um you're going to talk to us a little bit about um the trail position thanks dave okay mm -hmm. The uh, trail position, the working area is located between the team bench area line and the center line. And in the trail position, the trail controls a wide area where they keep a proper distance from the players with an active mindset where they are prepared to analyze the next movement. Um, the trail position normally works on the court. However, as Kayla mentioned, there are situations where you may need to move in a different spot on the floor. An example for me that comes to mind would be uh, a trap at the center line and side line of the court where we, where we would need to step off the court and, and make that decision to move. Next slide. The uh, trail position working area. So the working area, as you can see highlighted in the green is between the team bench area line and the center line. And when the ball moves closer to the trail sideline, trail should move further onto the court to maintain an open angle. 
And then Dave's going to dive into the cross step to put ourselves uh, or how we put ourselves in the best position to referee uh, the gap between the players. Okay. Thanks very much, Alyssa. So trail cross step. So this is one of these things and Rob already um, alluded to it. Um, if the play goes one way, um, you want to cross step and actually go the other way. Um, so if Stace, if you just click, right? So whenever the trail's straight lined, uh, you need to assess the play and you got to look at which side um, the ball is going to go to. So if the ball is going to the players right here, um, the trail official wants to step to the left. Okay, so cross step in the opposite direction. And the same goes the other way. If the play goes to the left, uh, then the trail official wants to cross step to the right to maintain um, distance and look at um, refereeing, um, refereeing the play. Okay, so um, when the play is over, you know, even though we've cross stepped into, if we've cross stepped into the court, you want to return um, closer to the sideline in their standard uh, working position. So Stace, I've got this, uh, I've got this um, clip pulled up. And uh, what I want you to look at is, um, I'm going to play this clip a couple of times, uh, just confirm that everybody can see that. Okay, we're good. Okay, so this is really, um, you know, I, I was looking for clips and things like that. Um, this is what you want to look like when you're working uh, from trail. Um, and uh, Alyssa touched on it a little bit um, about the working area, which if we look at here, uh, you know, the trails working area, you know, if we go to the bench team area, all the way up to the center line, um, that's what we're looking at. So I'm going to play this clip through a couple of times. But what I want you to realize is like, if you're looking at what you should look like at trail, um, this is a this is a good, a good clip. So I just want to break this down a little bit. So if we look at this play initially, um, the trail official sort of can anticipate, you know, which way the play is going. You know, this play is a handoff play and play is going this way. And the trail official takes a nice cross step so that they can look down into the play um, as, we, as we move. So this is like something that we want to uh, sort of emulate when we when we referee. So let me click off of this, and we go here. And there's that and there's that cross step in that in that 45 in that squaring up to the play that Mike talked about. Um, and you know, field of vision. He's got you know one, two, three, four, five, six players in, in their field of vision. Now the play is going to go a handoff here. The play is going to go back up to the top. Watch the uh, watch the trail official cross step and look at that, All right? Again, cross step and got, and got into the right position to make um, potential call. And the last one, play goes this way. Trail official cross steps opposite direction, looks right down on the play and then is able to pick up the foul call. So lots of good things to look at on this clip. And if we want to look at, you know, if we want to, what we're supposed to look like at trail, this is something that we're supposed to look like at trail. Uh, the other thing that if you play this clip a little bit later on is this official and, you know, Mike Thompson talked about, you know, uh, officials making calls and walking like this official call arm straight up counts one, two, Everybody knows that, that this is a foul, stays with the play. Um, and these are some of the things that, that we've got to work on. We've got to sort of try to be uh, a little bit better at that. Okay. So Stace, thanks very much. Um, so uh, you're going to talk a little bit about the center position. Just let me get my screen back up here.
So from the center position, our working area that we're talking about is free throw line extended. And we're working a couple of steps up beyond that line and also a couple of steps down. Any play on the weak side towards the basket is the center's primary. Um, and you'll remember from our, um, uh, from our presentation last week, weak side in officiating is any time that we have a sing single official. So we're talking about the center side, not in relation to where the ball is. So any play on the weak side towards the basket is the center's primary. Center has to remember to be ready to make the call when there is any illegal action or contact. So we talk a lot about needing an active, strong active center in order to make a three-person crew a successful one. If, uh, if the center is missing the illegal contact and is passive, this will force uh, the lead to be more active. And like we talked about before, the worst case scenario of um, our lead cross calls. So this is where we talked about that primary um, concept in three-person of trusting your partner, taking care of your primary area, and being uh, ready to referee. If we know that center is going to uh, take care of that call as the ball progresses to the basket. We are going to increase our call accuracy and get away from the uh, cross calls and, and guessing as well. Yeah. In terms of position, our setup line is free throw line extended and the center is usually working on the court. But as we mentioned uh, with our other positions, we need to move to get the best angle and the best position possible. So this setup position uh, is where we're going to begin from, but we're going to go where we need to, to make the best possible call. All right, so in our diagram, we'll have a look here at the working area. Either side of the court, center is currently set up on court, foul line extended for the setup point and then two steps above and two steps below that point. And like we talked about before, trust is critical as well as center being active and ready to, uh, to take care of all calls on their side. The cross step in the center position is going to be very similar to what we've talked about with the uh, lead and trail positions. So as a one is progressing to the baskets, so we have a weak side drive. The center should react by taking that cross step in the opposite direction of the players. So if a one is driving uh, to the basket, a left-handed drive here, our center position is going to cross step in the opposite direction to be able to get a good look. There is going to be a moment where you're going to be straight line. So even in this diagram, you can tell that as a one is progressing, that center official is going to be looking into their back for a second, but it is momentary and it is going to improve our position to be able to referee the play from start to finish. So it is something that is um, critical that we, we take care of and that we do. Okay. Thanks very much, Stacy. So uh, I've got a couple of clips here. Stacy, I'll take the, uh, oh no, you can play them. Go ahead. Um, see, so see we've got happens. a couple of click. Yeah. See what happens. If not, there we go. So, John, um, maybe if you just want to pause that clip just for a second, Stace. Um, so, John, if you could maybe comment, uh, this is a, a clip that I took off the Alberta, I think, website um, showing uh, a really active uh, center official uh, cross-stepping into the play. So, if you could maybe comment on that. Uh, and I've got another clip sort of as a comparison uh, um, on the next one. So, go ahead, Stace, play it a couple of times. Can you play it all the way through, Stace, please? Thank you. Great job. Uh, referee did a great job. Cross-stepped, looked down the lane, had a real good look at the play, blew his whistle, told his partner what was happening, what did that referee leave out? If I was a referee coach looking at this clip, what would I, what would I in, your, in the chat box, what did the referee leave out? 
I know we don't have I know we don't have sound. He missed the number, yes. Foul signal, yep. What didn't he tell his partners? Shooting two. Shooting, yep. Communication with partners, you're right, Doug. Who's my shooter? Okay, we want to know, and we, when you look at that clip, the referee had to look back to get the number of the foul, which is, which is fine. So if, if we were look, looking at this from an educational point, we want the referee to take a, take a breath, blow his whistle, give, uh, give the information, make sure he has everything he needs before he goes to the bench. So color, number, nature, consequence. So in this play, it would be black, 12, two shots, 11, white is my shooter. So if we can communicate that to our partners, they have everything set up, we make the game smooth. So good move in the cross step, really looked really good in the play. No coach is going to argue that call because he had the best look on the court. What I liked about the clip was lead had, didn't look in that area at all. Lead was open in a 45 degree angle, trusted in his partner. So that other information, um, as we move up into three person, let's make sure we, we get in the habit of doing those things as well. Great. Thank you very much, John. So uh, I have a, another clip that's a comparison of this clip and uh, one that we showed last week. Um, and as you can see in this clip, the, the center is, is very active. Um, so I've circled uh, the two officials. And uh, Stacy, if you could play it uh, a couple of times. And then John, maybe you can comment on the differences between the plays um, for on this. Thanks very much. Okay, a couple of times because it's pretty quick. Okay, and then we'll pause it right about there. So in one, we see we see an active center, and we talked about in the in the uh, in the pregame that the key to a successful three person crew is having an active center from start to the end of the game. And so if I was on the court and we came in as a crew and we said, how do we do? I can tell if we've had a good game, if our center has been active and has blown the, wh blown the whistle and made a, a number of calls. So we want to make sure that a lot of calls come from center. So when we're moving with a purpose to see the play from start to finish, that active center is going to see a lot. And it's really important. I, I want to challenge everyone on the call as, as the uh, WNBA season uh, winds up and the NBA season gets to playoffs, I want you to watch the three per, the, the crews that are working those games. They don't seem to move very often, but when they move, it's one or two steps to get the best look at the play. So they are in perfect setup position 99% of the time. They know where they're going on the court They've obviously done lots of games at this level, but they, when they move, it's just one or two steps. So I, I think it's really important that we get that into our minds. We're not going to have to move five or six steps to get the best look. It's one or two steps up in a cross step or one or two steps down. Um, so as you're watching the uh, NBA playoffs and the WNBA playoffs uh, play first games, first games that are playing uh, starting next week, Watch how the referees get set up and watch how they move on the court. I, I, I challenge you to do that. Sometimes you look and you'll go, they hardly move at all because they're in perfect position. And when they move, it's one or two steps. Oh, thanks very much, John. Very insightful. Um, Stace, if you could just play that uh, clip one more time. Okay. And, and John, it's pretty safe to say this is sort of the difference between an active C and, uh, and a passive C. Absolutely. Right? right, okay, excellent. Okay, thanks very much. Okay, so the last thing that we're gonna talk about is, uh, Rob, you're gonna take us through um, these trap situations uh, that come up during a game. Awesome, sounds good. So 
Uh, this situation, uh, I think, has probably happened to a lot of people. If it has, hasn't yet, it's, uh, it's certainly going to. And I think that when uh, John had talked about trust in the crew and having a good pregame, and for me, this is one uh, that needs to be discussed. And the reason for that is when, when this situation, when we have that trap up there on center side uh, towards the center line, this can lead, if the crew is not in sync and hasn't discussed how this should be officiated, this can lead to us ending up with a, a missed rotation. We can end up with inadvertent rotations by a C. We end up with two leads on the other end. We can end up with a lot of things uh, that could really go, uh, go wrong here quickly. So the way that we want to referee this play is if we have a trap like this up on center side, close to the center line, we want center to move up towards the center line to be able to officiate that play again taking that mindset of we move where we need to be to see the play the biggest thing with this though is that this does not initiate a rotation so Kayla had spoke earlier in the presentation that um, lead is who initiates our rotation so we want center to go up to to be able to referee this play again seeing the legality of the defenders uh, being able to see that space but not referee the space we want to referee the defense um, keeping the offense in mind. But once that trap has been alleviated, and if a rotation has not occurred, we're going to have center come back down to their position. So Stace, if we can click through this. So there we go. After the trap is over, center is going to come back down. They're going to return to that initial setup position at the free throw line extended. Um, so too often we see sometimes, myself included, where we go up as center and we think that we have initiated a rotation. This is not the case. Uh, center does not initiate that rotation. We're going to hold off for lead to initiate it. Um, but if that trap is alleviated or if it's broken, we're coming back as center back into our initial setup position. All right. That's one of those tough plays that you really have to pregame, as uh, John pointed out uh, earlier. And these are things that you need to discuss as a crew on how you're going to cover it. So there is a lot to talk about. Um, when you do get into the pregame, um, you know, uh, thanks very much, uh, uh, Rob, John, Stacy, Alyssa, Kayla. Um, I really appreciate um, you being on this call and taking us through some plays. Um, Georgia, do you have any questions in the chat? Um, I do not, but I would encourage people to, to ask. Um, I know some, uh, so, uh, some people started questions, but then kind of pulled back. Um, just to, to answer one of the questions early in the chat, um, this is Peter McDonald is videotaping this and it will be provided um, along with um, hopefully the slides, um, but it won't happen until June, until all four presentations are done. So um, you can okay. use it after, after June. Um, if you have any questions, please either on mic or on mic unmute um, or um, type it into the chat. So for Rob, uh, would the T ever come over to help the C with the trap? In that, so in that situation, again, based on court coverage, that is centers uh, that is centers primary coverage area. So center has right right up to that center line. So we would want center to to be officiating that. Now, that being said, um, as always, we want to know where our partners are and where, they're, where the ball is and who's, who's refereeing that play. So as that trap very well could, we know it's not going to be a stationary thing in basketball, that trap could progress across that split line towards the lead's primary coverage area, in which case we would need to make sure that center uh, and, and trail are, are being able to communicate with each other using body language to know who has picked what up. Awesome. Um, if the center was that high on the trap, why would the lead not move to be on the ball side? I would say that that's a great question. And I think it would depend on how long that trap stays. If that is a trap that's prolonged um, and that becomes uh, the, where the majority of our players are, that may be a reason for lead to rotate across. I would expect to see lead in at least closed down position, ready to uh, potentially initiate that. Uh, that rotation. However, that trap could just be in a quick moment. The ball could be skipped across, and we don't want to be yo-yoing back and back and forth um, across that baseline as lead. So we want to make sure that the ball is established there. Uh, so we may be looking to see where does the ball come out of there. If the ball is passed down to the corner, that might be a good reason to initiate a rotation. But if the ball is skipped across, 
then we wouldn't need a rotation as a crew. Anyone can take this one. So Kayla, Alyssa, John, Rob, um, if, if drive starts from the strong side and ends at the weak side and the foul is at the weak side under the hoop, whose call? So we're going to use those that diagram that we had at the beginning of our PowerPoint for the PCA. Um, but I mean, it really comes down to where contact is and who has the best open angle. Um, if I'm lead, we're preventing that cross call, but there could be contact happening on lead side that center and no matter where they cross step is not going to be able to see. So it really just comes down to who has the best angle. Um, but I would say if the, if the ball has progressed over to weak side, uh, the contact is probably going to be seen best by center official, but that doesn't mean that lead can't see anything that's happening. And we're going to talk a little bit about, um, you know, uh, shot coverage and dual coverage areas in uh, next week's session. So we're probably going to revisit that question um, next week too. So uh, thanks very much, Kayla. Excellent. Um, Rob, this is for you. Does the movement from center to cover the trap not initiate the lead rotation? Uh, great question. Um, it happens a lot, but no, that would be, uh, that's not what we would want to see. We want lead who has that big picture of what's happening with that 45 degree can see the entire play. We would want lead to be the one who would initiate that rotation based on where that ball might be passed out of the trap and based on where the majority of players are going to be set up. And then just for a clarification, Alex is asking, did I hear correctly that we want the center to be more involved in calls? Yes, Absol absolutely. Yeah. Um, if you remember from our presentation last week, we talked about lead being in that action zone and taking and um, usually calling 50 to 60% um, of calls. So if we then have center um, in a more passive role and not making calls, the number of calls coming from our trail official is going to go up exponentially. And it's going, also going to ask them to have to, to guess and call out of their area more often. So if center is active and engaged, um, lead is going to be able to trust their partner. And as a crew, we're going to have um, much better coverage and a, and a much better game overall. So yes, definitely we need center involved and um, active in, in making those calls. And, and John, was, sorry, go ahead, John. If you look at what teams are doing now, they're trying to free up the three-point shooters. And where is that action taking place? It's taking place above the top of the key um, on both sides of the ball. And they're running double screens and horns and everything in the, in the game to free up shooters. So trail and lead, or sorry, trail and center have to be active and ready to referee, or we're going to have rough play. We're going to miss calls. Um, you know, we're going to miss fouls on shooters. So center and trail both have to be much more active and, and key to the game. Again, I'll say is center, but trail as well, because on, on their side of the ball, when there's high screens and we, and we allow contact, we miss uh, illegal contact on a shooter, it gets our crew in trouble and we can't recover from that as a crew. Next question is, can you speak to when the T gives up the ball handler? Oh, I just got moved down. I apologize. Chat just got moved down. <laughs> can you speak to when the T gives up the ball handler coverage at the top of the key as they go towards uh, the weak side C accepting the play? So as they cross the split line, when they cross the split line, yes. And again, um, we don't do a good job of this in Canada because every conference seems to have their own, let's make it three quarter court. Let's make it, you know, we all do a little bit different. The West does, you know, BC does it one way and Nova Scotia does it one way. Let's keep that split line right across. Michael. Sorry, sorry, John, I, I didn't mean to stop your answer. Yeah. Finish, your, finish your answer, and I want to add something to this one. Sure. So in our pregame, we're going to talk about when the ball crosses the split line and we give up that, we give up the play to our partner. So really important that we're consistent about that across Canada. So I, I just wanted to add, John's 100% right from the technical technical mechanic, but the answer to the question is when the C accepts the play. So you're not going to give it up when they cross the split line, unless you're certain that the C 
has accepted the play and taken the ball. So, uh, gentlemen, can I just uh, can I just go back to the clip that I played, and we'll look at the body language of the trail and the sea. Um, and I think you'll see a good example. I think of of what you're talking about. Okay, so um, can everybody see that? Yes. Okay, so this is what we talked, to, and this sort of addresses when the ball crosses the uh, the, the split line there. Uh, I think really good, like watch the, the, the language, the body language of this center official and this trail official. These, these two officials are in sync uh, because as we play this, right? The center official steps up to look at this and immediately the trail official's attention goes into the key. You can see where his, his, his head looks. Ball comes back and the center official returns. So I, I, I'm, I think that that's a good example of, you know, a center accepting the play and then play goes away. And just looking at his step up to referee, okay, and then it goes away. And if we look at that trail official, as soon as that step up and this accepting the play, this trail official's attention turns into the key area. So I think that's an example of maybe um, what we're talking about. Dave, while you still have that on the screen as well, when the ball mm -hmm. is um, with that player, when we talk about this, the split line, it's just one step over. But we often say, oh, what is it? And to, to the point, as soon as it crosses the split line, we've added, had it accepted. But if you highlight there, it's just one step. But that's, that's enough to initiate that transfer. So. Right. And there, and there is that one step over and that center official, like, now has this play right and the and the trail official is turned in i think that's sort of what we were looking at uh, as far as you know accepting play right dave one more question um in regards mm -hmm. to center um doug doyle would like to know if there's any um situation where the center can initiate the rotation yeah i'll leave that one up to the uh john or or cap or oh I'm going to say no. It's yeah. the, answer, the answer is no. Uh, the answer is no. <laughs> Mike, if you want to elaborate on why, but the answer is no. Uh, lead, lead, is di lead dictates and initiates all rotations. You answered the question fully wrong. Within, yeah. within our FIBA mechanics, the lead dictates all rotations, controls all rotations. That doesn't mean that our leads don't need to have a bigger perspective on the game. And, uh, and that doesn't mean there aren't times that the lead needs to rotate, particularly when the ball goes to the weak side, to the center. We need the lead to look to initiate that rotation. But we simplify the mechanics and simply leave it up to the lead to control the rotations. Otherwise, if we start to have other people dictating the rotations, we're going to get ourselves out of sync very quickly. Right. Exactly. Okay. So um, I think that concludes our, or do we have some more? I've got a couple of more questions. Rob okay, Spatafora, sure. your uh, question is very convoluted. Can you please unmute and ask it? Um, I don't want to misrepresent it in your description. Certainly. Um, it just boils down to with a uh, ball in T's primary and on the assume on the right side of the court and we're uh, we're in a strong side position with both the lead and T on the same side and the ball handler starts to drive right. So we know T has to do a cross step slightly to the left and slightly up. Is, is it good practice after the cross steps completed for, for T to move down as the ball handler continues to drive towards the right end line, or does that create too much of a chance of making a call while in motion? Should we stay still after that cross step to the right, uh, to the left and up? Or should we move down after that cross step? Mm -hmm. I'll take that one, guys. Um, okay. We want, in a perfect world, we want the referee to be stationary when they make the call because then they can see the play from start to finish and their eyes are not bouncing. So if we're moving, um, if, if we think about frames in a, in a movie if, and our eyes are bouncing, we're not going to get a good look. So stop and referee the play. You're in a perfect dangle you don't have to get any deeper um just just robert i i think 
we don't want the referee moving at all if if if, if possible. So after so so after just because after you've made that cross step, you've got your look. Don't worry about your proximity between you and the ball handler. You have the look. Just stay there. Absolutely. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Rob. Thanks, Rob. I think that's it for questions. Okay. So thanks, Georgia. Uh, just uh, one last comment um, before we go. Um, first of all, thank everybody for being on the call. And for uh, veteran officials and newer officials, um, one thing that I've learned uh, is that tape is is a really good thing. And what we want to do is don't be afraid to put yourself out there. Um, like a lot mm -hmm. of these clips are, are of myself. Um, and uh, I look at these clips on ways that I can improve uh, and help other people improve uh, by just looking at, you know, what I can do better. Um, so, uh, you know, have the courage to put yourself out there, to have somebody have a look at your plays. Um, if you if you have a question and things like that, um, it, it really, really gets you better. And uh, I want to thank everybody uh, for being on the call. Um, Rob, John, Mike, uh, Stacy, Kayla, Alyssa, uh, I really appreciate your time. And Georgia, always. Okay. Thank you, everybody. We'll see you, uh, everyone, next week. We are on on uh, next Tuesday again at uh, 730. Um, uh, Rike at Canada Basketball will be sending out uh, uh, the Zoom information, but if you don't get it, it is the same link as tonight. As usual, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to email me. Have a wonderful week. And uh, thank you, John, Kayla, Alyssa, Rob. And without you, Stacey and Dave, we couldn't uh, make this happen. So thank you very much and uh, have a wonderful week.